Um, so I assume that all of you know the basics of machine learning, that you have been taking a class on machine learning. Uh, am I correct? Okay, good. So the bread and butter of machine learning is empirical risk minimization, right? So it is an abstraction, like everything machine learning is, is an abstraction. So a data set is an abstraction of a real problem, right? And empirical risk minimization tells you that if you have a data set and you want to build a statistical model, a predictive model, what you do, you shuffle the data set, plug your favorite optimizer, typically stochastic gradient descent, if you have as a predictive model a neural net, let's say. And then kaboom, you have your predictive model. And then you're done. Turns out that it's not quite that. So if you think about your life as a machine learning practitioner, as a student, as a researcher, what happens is slightly different. What happens is that you are given some data. And the first thing that you do maybe is you inspect. Maybe you look at the the energy of the uh, eigenvalues. Maybe you look at the distribution of the different uh, components, right? And then oftentimes you have also a time window, right? Maybe you meet your advisor every week. Maybe you have your submission deadline a month away, right? So you have a finite time horizon. And the question is, how should I spend whatever computer I have to make the best out of it, right? And that's a very different problem. And so, Actually, I skipped the slide. And this was the slide that I was supposed to show you. So when, whenever you are given a task, oftentimes you look at the data, you try something, actually you say, oh, look at this data. This data set looks like this other data set that I used in the past. Let me perhaps grab the architecture, the code, maybe a parameter vector from which you initialize your model, right? And then you run experiments. Typically, the first experiment is always can be improved and then you iterate a few times. So it is a process that evolves over time, right? And so the question here is how can we make this more automated and how can we make it more efficient? In fact, it's not a single task, but over life you come across a sequence of tasks, right? So when I, you know, I did my thesis looking at images of pollen grains, and then I move to MNIST, and I move to you know, Caltech 101, and, and, and so on and so forth, right? It's a process. Can we automate this? Can we make it more efficient? It is actually more interesting than this because we are not alone. We work as a community, and there are many of us that are doing the same thing, but we are not independent from each other, right? So we borrow ideas, we borrow parameters, we borrow things from each other, and um, as a whole, we are developing a single distributed machine learning system that evolves over time. Now, this is not quite working as, as I wish because it's very inefficient. Every time we, you know, we do manual search, we restart from scratch and can we automate this? And I think this is important nowadays because if you look at, uh, recent advances in machine learning of the past, I would say starting 10 years ago, there has been a push for building bigger and bigger models. Uh, and these bigger models, you feed them all the data, you make them as big as possible, they become pretty good, really, really good. And the bigger you made them, the, the better they are. But I think we are hitting a wall. These models are compute bound, right? Um, is that a problem, Alessandro? Okay, so I'll go. So we are using pretty much all the compute that we have, right? And we need to make things more efficient. And so there are a lot of questions. And, and so there are a lot of questions around this. And one particular question is, relates to uh, large scale learning, which is what I'm most interested. So in large scale learning, what you do, again, you train your big, uh, let's see, do you see my, oh yeah, you see. Uh, you train your big neural net and then you um, adapt it to a bunch of downstream tasks, right? And then after a while, you got a little more compute, a little bit more data, and then you retrain from scratch a bigger neural net. Again, you shuffle all the data, right? And then you, you burn a lot of money while doing that. And then you uh, deploy a bunch of downstream tasks. Again. 
this is very inefficient. So the continuum learning dream is the following, that it is actually a sequential learning process and through every, each and every interaction with a data set, here I'm, I'm thinking about supervised learning, but it's the same uh, if you want to do a right. At each interaction, or, uh, with each interaction, uh, uh, with each data set, you learn, okay? The model learns, the model perhaps grows, the model updates a little bit. And the question is, how can we make this process efficient? And this is the question that I'm interested in exploring my research, okay? And there are a lot of open questions about this. The first one, which relates to this talk is, if we want to develop methods that are never ending learning, that are efficient, we need some data to play with. We need to, uh, to have a playground, right? Uh, and so what is this playground? What kind of metrics shall we be using? Because again, empirical risk minimization is just about a loss function, which is a surrogate for accuracy. But here we are talking about a multi-object optimization because it's not just about accuracy, but also you want to have some notion of efficiency. And then there are many other questions here. I just put a brain dump, but I'm pretty sure you can come up with more. But in this talk, I'm gonna focus on the first part. And so last year with uh, my friends at DeepMind, we were developing a benchmark for this problem. That is called never ending visual classification stream. It is for computer vision, but it's really not really modality specific, um, not so much. Uh, and, and this is uh, going to be what I'm going to focus in, in, in this presentation. Are there questions about never ending learning and, and what I mean and, and uh, the whole motivation before I move on? There must be at least one. Yes. But is it possible also to have like a pipeline that uh, like it is increasing complexity? Like, uh, That's a very excellent. So the, the question is if we work with tasks, how are the tasks related? Uh, and, and can we make tasks uh, more complex with time? Um, so, so this relates to the question of how do you even build a benchmark? Where, where do you source tasks? Why would you pick a certain task versus another task? Because that will buy us also the methods that will win that benchmark, right? That's a very good question. And I'm gonna give you the answer in, in, in a second. I'm gonna give you my particular choice for that. The other thing that I want to comment is that I would like to have, so this is about a benchmark, it's not about a method. I show you some results of baselines, but we are not proposing a method to solve this benchmark. Eventually, <laughs> working on algorithms, I would like to have something that is black box that works for pretty much any distribution that adapts over time, and if there is a relation, now, in order to transfer, you want the assumption, the underlying assumption is that these tasks relate to each other. That's why you can transfer something. Otherwise, there is nothing that, I mean, it's pointless, right? So the underlying assumption is that there is some structure at the meta level, at the level of tasks, right? Uh, but what this structure is, we are a little bit agnostic, okay? So. Yeah, 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 yeah. So my comment for now, let me get back to you. Maybe in a few slides it will, it will unfold and, and then you'll tell me if it is not clear. Any other question? But yeah, the short answer is that, yes, that has to be part of the metric. Okay, so the way that we constructed this benchmark is by taking a domain that many people in the group were familiar with. Um, and so we took uh, computer vision, okay? But I didn't really want to pick this task versus the other task. And, and, and so what we did, we went online and searched for proceedings of computer vision conferences over the past three decades. 
And then for, from every year, we picked 90 papers. At, so first we sorted these proceedings chronologically, okay? And then from every year, we sample at random 90 papers from these proceedings, up to 90 papers. I mean, back, back in the MCV 90 something, there were no, <laughs> not even 90 papers. And then from each of these papers, we manually extracted the tasks that people use to evaluate their method. Okay, so maybe in this paper they use Amnist, in this other paper they use ImageNet, okay. And then we record this and we build a stream, a stream of tasks, right, that people have used over time. And then we remove the data sets that are not publicly available, that, that are not good for research purposes, right? And a lot of repetitions because otherwise the stream will become too long. And so as a result of that, we have a stream that has over 100 tasks, overall about 8 million images, okay? So it's eight times image, not, it's not huge. It has many, many domains. I mean, it, it has a good number of domains, right? And so this is a manual annotation. You see uh, at the bottom here, year versus domain. And so you can see that the stream is nicely non-stationary. So uh, going back to the first question, you have, so the answer to your question for, for this particular benchmark is that we are just tracking what the vision community has been doing. So we are doing kind of behavior cloning of the computer vision community, trying to be as good as them, perhaps better, <laughs> more efficient. And so over time you have some domains that appear, some that uh, like, uh, I don't know, taxa that come and go, uh, some new that uh, appear later on. The size of the data sets tend to increase over time. So it, it, it is quite interesting and challenging. And it is simple in the sense that each data set, each task is very simple. It's an image classification task. Give an image, predict the corresponding label. It's the simplest, it's the most well understood machine learning setting. It's reproducible by construction. It is unbiased to task selection in the sense that just what people have been using in, in the literature. And so the idea for this is that if you succeed at this, then you can deploy your system and, and use it on the next submission of CVPR or CCV. <laughs> we'll do well, right? And then it satisfies the Goldilocks principle. It's not too small, it's not too big. It's not too small that you know whatever you do then it doesn't scale and it's not meaningful. It's not too large scale that nobody can do research on, right? So it, it has an intermediate uh, scale. Although you'll see that it gets a little intensive too, if you want to push. So these are examples of, you know, the, the first data sets in, in the stream and, and the last data sets. It ends in 2021 when, when there was a lot of uh, interest in COVID classification related tasks. So just to give you an idea of of what, what's in the stream. So it, it's a lot of diversity. Um, so let's talk about metrics. And this goes back to Alessandro's question a little bit. So we are measuring two things, error rate. In this case, we measure just the average error rate over the stream. We tried also other metrics like average relative error rate or things like that. But at the end, the ranking of the methods was the same. And so we, we picked the simplest. And then the second metric is cumulative flops, okay? So we record how many flops you do at each task, including hyperparameter selection. At the end, we are going to put a dot in this error rate, average error rate versus cumulative uh, flop uh, plane, okay? And that a point here is an experiment on the whole stream. Okay, so to go back to Alessandro's question, we want things to be as close to the origin as possible. Right. So there is no constraint. There is no constraint. So uh, that's right. This is, yeah. You could also specify a next uh, axis and, and try to see, but uh, in, yeah, there is no constraint. So if you have little compute, you will be working this area, right? If you, if you want to get state of the art performance, you will be in this area. Uh, it's up to you, depending on how many resources you have. So, 
Right, so we actually had two kinds of tasks. One is uh, plain image classification for which error rate uh, it's just array. And the other is multi label. And then we use mean average precision for that. I mean, for, 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 for simplicity, let, let, let's think about just image classification. Uh, yeah. Spot on. Here, here it is. <laughs> yeah, the question is how do you cross validate and how do you write? Uh, that's actually a very interesting question. And we, we were scratching our heads a little bit because now you have for every task a learner, right? But you also have a meta learner uh, and there are the meta learner sets hyperparameters for the learner, but also the meta learner has hyperparameters. What we want eventually the goal is to measure how well you do on future tasks, right? Take into account compute. And so for that purpose, we, we divide the stream into parts. One is meta train and the other is meta test. So the tasks from the first uh, 27 years are meta train for your development and meta learner tuning. And the last three years are for meta test. So that's where you do just one pass over each task. You can do multiple passes over the data set of each task, but you cannot go back in time and replay, you know, uh, tune parameters, right? You do one task at a time, and, and that's where we, we measure uh, the error rate. And, and, and I'm gonna go in a second in detail. So during meta train, okay, what we do, we have a, a sequence of tasks, it's about 90, okay? Every year has a different number of tasks. And here you can do whatever you want. If you want, you can skip this, this phase, you can uh, put all the data all together, you can run in sequence, you can, you can do whatever you want. Typically, but there is no constraint on this. Uh, and typically what, what, what you could do is that you run in sequence so that you are kind of, you're learning in the way that you will be tested on later on. And after you run, you measure this error rate and cumulative flops. And this is for a certain hyperparameter configuration of your meta learning. So this could be, I don't know, uh, how many uh, trials of my random search do I do over learning rate and, and, and width of number of channels on my convolution net. Okay. And then, uh, so the number of trials is a hyperparameter, right? So you run this for different numbers. You got different dots in this plane of error rate versus compute. And you update your meta learner here in our baselines. There is nothing that is learned. It's just manual. So we do a grid search and then we decide, you know, uh, that's how we picked a certain architecture or we picked uh, a certain number of trials for our uh, random search, for instance. After you do this, then there is the last pass over the stream. And essentially now you, uh, you do one pass, okay? And we record the average error rate over meta test. So this is just how well you generalize to new tasks, okay? And we record the total compute. And that's what we report, okay? Of course, there is a question of should we have done something better? Should we have done something different? For instance, you could split the meta train, meta, meta train and meta validation. You could do, you could imagine to do some sort of, uh, um, how do you call, uh, kind of online learning. I don't know. I actually don't know the answer to what is the best protocol. What we decided to do is just meta train, meta test. How people use meta train is up to them because that's also an open research question. Hopefully I didn't confuse everybody with this protocol because it has two levels and it's always a little bit, uh, but in a little bit, I, I give concrete examples of what uh, this is. So maybe it gets a little bit clearer, but the intended audience is people working on continual learning because this is about learning in non-stationary non stream. Meta learning, because you want to learn from a bunch of tasks in order to learn faster better uh, on new tasks and auto ML because this has to be black box, right? And 
uh, hyperparameter search goes into the compute cost. So you got to be smart about that. Now, uh, the hope is that people across these three communities will get together and, and use this benchmark. But uh, it is worth noting that it's not quite fitting the definitions of, of, of any of these three <laughs> subfields right now, because in continued learning, people assume that you have memory restriction. You cannot access past data, past models. Here, there is no restriction in terms of memory. Okay, But there is a strict causal evaluation in meta test and a lot of emphasis in trade-off between accuracy and compute, which typically people in continuing learning don't consider as much. Meta-learning, uh, it's not quite that either, because usually in meta-learning, you have a distribution of training tasks, and you have a distribution of test tasks that matches the uh, meta-train distribution, and you want to uh, learn from meta-train in order to adapt very uh, while on, on meta test. But here, the two distributions mismatch because you have a stream and, and the task distribution changes over time. And it's not just one step prediction, it is multi step. Right? And there is the emphasis on compute. AutoML, again, the, the, the difference is, is the fact that we have a sequence, right? And so this is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity because the reason why people don't use AutoML is because it's super expensive, right? But now, because you have a lot of tasks that, from which you can transfer parameters and hyperparameters of the meta learner, then maybe it would be the time that people come up with efficient ways to do AutoML. Questions about the setting? Okay, so. To recap, this is about trying to learn over time as an opportunity to be more efficient because we have to be more efficient at some point soon, okay? And having a benchmark, which the benchmark is for vision, but it's like, um, you know, you could do the same in other modalities. Um, and the key idea is to measure error rate versus compute. And uh, yeah, I think that, that that's the, the, the nugget here. Yeah. yeah. When you do this continuous learning, uh, let's say, does the network forget what it learned before? OK, so uh, let's see. So the question is, when you uh, learn from a data set to the next, is there forgetting? Because we do not have any restriction in terms of memory, you can instantiate a model for each task, okay? So we are not concerned with forgetting because you know, if, if you want to test on, if you are at task 30 and you want to test on task 20, you can load the model that you train on task 20, okay? The question is, it's not about forgetting, it's about forward transfer. So the question is, if I am at task 30, what can I do such that on task 31, I'm much better at learning. I'm much faster or more accurate or use less compute. So, but then when you do the cross-validation, you also consider the result of the previous models or not? Right. So when I do at the end, at the end of the day, what you will see in the graphs that I'm about to show is a point in the plane of average error rate versus uh, cumulative flops. And the average error rate is computed on meta test. Yeah, no, but uh, my question was that the three levels of validation, you do validation this one. Uh, yeah. uh, independently on each task, or you consider uh, the result of the uh, model that you obtained uh, from the past? So each model is evaluated on its own data set. Independent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The metric aggregates. No. Okay. So there is cross validation at the task level, whereby, as usual, I'm the model, I receive a data set. I take part of it from the training set for my uh, 
for my uh, cross validation, okay? Because my method learner told me that, oh, test over these different file learning rates. So I train, I, and then I pick the best learning rate based on my uh, validation set, okay? So that's the task level learner cross validation. There is another cross validation that has to happen, which is at the level of the meta learner. For instance, I want to try different architectures, right? I want to find the, so then uh, I would run the stream in the meta train, okay? For VGG, uh, ResNet uh, and Visual Transformer, so three, okay? And now I will have three points in this plane, but this, these are at the stream level, okay? And then I can decide to pick uh, Visual Transformer, okay? And then after that, I freeze my meta learner, decide that that's the architecture that I want to use in this case. And I do one last pass and then I report uh, generalization on meta test. Yes. Preprocessing. So that's that's also a, a question <laughs> that's say for the matter. In our experiments, we did the same preprocessing, which is we downscale the images all to the same resolution, which is really a terrible thing to do. <laughs> like that we have some data sets about counting, and we resize everything 64 by 64, which means that counting is impossible to do. It's a choice of the learner or, or the meta learner. In our, in our experiments, I, I'm going to go over the baselines. Uh, we did the same for everybody, but you don't have to, right? That's also something where you, there is a lot of room for improvement. Let me, let me give you an example. There. So I think your question is, what, what is knowledge and how is it transferred? How is it accrued? Absolutely. I'm going to give you some examples and be more concrete, OK? Yes. Yes, 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 but yes. So, um, what I, uh, if you, instead of removing the assumption, uh, it becomes more challenging, but uh, maybe it's possible that you can exploit uh, um, the similarities, for instance, uh, I don't know, the cluster flower, and maybe you add it in different parts. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. No, you, you can, you can. The, part, the the go already this one is a little complicated <laughs> so we, we but you can you can remove assumptions you can not tell the, the model that a, a new data set is coming you can stream you can do a lot of so you can use this um, benchmark also in other ways totally and that that would be quite interesting but uh, again my purpose was to uh, uh, abstract uh, uh, my life as a computer vision researcher. Like, can, can, can I, can I, you know, uh, relieve my life and, and with an automated system and see what I, if I can do better than what I did when I was a student and then a researcher. Yeah, but it's it's a valid question. It depends what you're looking for. Okay, so maybe let me go over some results and, and talk about baselines. Okay, we have about 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Okay, so. I'm going to come back to your question, I promise. Uh, so we have tested a few different baselines. I'm going to talk about actually quite many in the tech report you will see, but here I'm going to focus on the three most simple ones. So uh, the first one is independent training. So the idea is very simple. Here in the middle, you have each bar correspond to the data of each task. So this is the data of task one, task two, and task three. And here you just in instantiate the same network at random on each task independently. So there is no knowledge transfer whatsoever, okay? We wish to be this. If we don't be this, we, we are in trouble, okay? The second baseline, we have several variants in the paper, but the most interesting one is here, is fine tuning, okay? So here the idea is that you are at task three, okay? You instantiate this network, and the question is, where should I initialize my parameters from? Should I initialize from task one or task two? Okay. And the way that we have done this is in a very naive and greedy way, which is that we take a subset of task three data, we feed it to the first network and to the second network. So the network of the first task and the second task. 
we extract features and then we do k nearest neighbor okay so it's a very greedy thing i don't know maybe after you train things will be different but very greedy we decide that task relatedness is defined in this way and then let's say that uh task one gave better kenya's neighbor accuracy and then we initialize from task one okay uh the third baseline that i want to talk about is multitasking okay so in multitasking every time that you see a new task you train jointly on the data of all the tasks seen so far so every time you add a head a new classification head and you train on a mix on a weighted mix and so the, the, the weight is going to be a hyper parameter of the learner okay how many trials you make for for that weight will be a hyper parameter of the meta learner okay um okay so here is an example of what we got okay so as i said x-axis cumulative flops y-axis average error each dot is the result of running on the entire stream okay so if we do 16 hyperparameter trials for each task we have 107 tasks it's 1600 experiments so each dot is is run through the entire stream okay including hyperparameter selection Okay, so this is the first thing to notice. The second thing to notice is that in this talk, I'm gonna focus on, on the yellow area because we wanted to prove ourselves that we can achieve state-of-the-art accuracy on a bunch of data sets. Otherwise, people won't believe us. Going back to Alessandro's original question, I think uh, how much compute do you need? So for the point over here, if you have a single GPU, A100, Mm, single GPU, it would be a, around 112 days. However, <laughs> if you if you are happy to have higher error rate, you can go in this area where it takes a few days. And if you go here, it is about a day. If you go down here, it, it, it's about it, it is uh, quite some time. Okay. So what what we did was using multiple GPUs at the same time. Uh, okay, but we are going to focus on, on the yellow area, but uh, it's possible also to, you know, you, you decide your operating point, right? Um, so essentially, you have the red curve, which is independent. Likely, it is the highest, so it's, that's the worst, so we're good. And then we have multitasking in green, and then the kind of smart point tuning is in yellow here. So point tuning won this competition so far and there is a big gap between independent and this fine tuning like it's a difference of several points of error rate so we are many data sets have an error rate around one percent two percent so here we are talking about a big difference like uh, i think a third of the data sets have a pretty low error rate so um the best methods in absolute in terms of error rate is uh, are the methods that are pre-trained. So here we took, um, a, I don't know if people are familiar, but essentially a clip style flamingo uh, visual system. So it's something that is trained on lots of data from the internet that has an image and a corresponding text, okay? It's a very large model, okay? So much bigger than the one that uh, I'm showing over here. And then we take that, and fine tune from it for every task, right? And we have a version where we also do smart fine tuning. So at every task, you can decide whether to start from the big pre-trained model or from a derived version of it. Maybe, you know, uh, you take uh, the, the parameter value from task three, which itself was fine tuned from the big pre-trained model, okay? Oh, no, 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 no. No, these models have all the same size. Yes. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to fine tune. I mean, at least not in a nice way. Okay. You, you could compress. We didn't do that. Okay. And you're like implicitly, you're saying, hey, but we should also account for memory. We're not doing that. Uh, nor we're looking at computer test time. Okay. There are many limitations, but I think having already two numbers is, is quite a bit too. <laughs> 
may I go back to your question? So uh, your question was knowledge. What is knowledge? So it depends on, on the baseline here. Independent has no knowledge transfer. Multitasking here, it's in the data sets. So essentially you have a state for the meta learner and over time you aggregate more and more data sets. That's your, your knowledge stored as raw examples. For fine tuning, it's just the set of uh, parameter vectors for each of the previous tasks. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, you need to evaluate as many models as tasks you've seen in, in the past, uh, but the evaluation can be done on a small subset of the data. So, the, so in, in the grand scheme of doing cross-validation training, this is nothing. We have another that, that would be interesting to do. Okay, so uh, I wanted to tell you about that. And then if you look, if, you, if we zoom in, in in this area that is uh, with a large P-train models, okay? What you see is something like this. So the red curve is if you just always pre-train from the original large scale model and the uh, um, light blue curve is if you allow yourself to do smart fine tuning, okay? So don't necessarily function from the guy. To make Alessandro happy, I have a graph. There we go. So <laughs> it's not a graph that, <laughs> that you may want to see, but essentially this, this shows you, it's a graph. So this shows you the chain of fine tuning, okay? So each box is a task, okay? And it shows you over time uh, from which data set the model has decided to fine tune from. Based on these Kenyan's neighbor heuristics, you can pick some other ones. And so you can see it's quite interesting. So the, you, you have the ImageNet hub here, of course. Uh, there is a little bit of clustering. But so the, the color is based on the domain. So you have a, you know, the OCR task that kind of cluster together. So there is a lot of structure, right? So this shows you that it is doing something kind of reasonable. And, 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 and building like a population of models that are related to each other in an interesting way. And this is following the chronological- uh, Yeah, yeah. So it was populated based on, on, on the task order in, in the sequence. So there are a few hubs, okay? ImageNet is the biggest one. Uh, there are long chains. So, you know, uh, oftentimes we are afraid that, oh, if you keep fine tuning, the model is gonna uh, get stuck, right? We didn't observe that. Uh, even though some of these tasks are really small and we kind of overtrain because we didn't do early stopping. So there are long chains, which is quite interesting. If you look at the graph that you got when you start from a pre-trained model, the Flamingo model that I mentioned before, the uh, graph structure is much more organized and actually it makes much more sense. You have uh, a lot of medical data sets, you have well, this is traffic sign that looks like faces, because <laughs> it's round shapes, but you have a uh, texture, you have OCR over there. It is, again, what's interesting is that not, every, not everything starts from the root node or the original giant pre-train model. And so some people say, hey, with a large pre-train model, it, you got universal representation. You don't need to further uh, tune them. No, at least according to this benchmark, this is not true. If you further tune, you can get even better representation for future transfer, which is really nice. I was very pleased to see. Um, are there questions? Because otherwise I'll go on some ablations or I don't know. Um, okay. Uh, so something quite interesting is if you zoom in in this computation budget, Let's look at what happens over time. And one way to look at what happens over time is to look at a regret kind of plot where on the y-axis this time we had the cumulative relative error relative to independent, okay? So uh, the x-axis is time, like uh, task one, task two, task three. 
And then instead of plotting the average error rate for task three, we plot average error rate of task three minus the error rate of the independent baseline. Okay, so essentially, if you see a horizontal line, it means that we do as well as independent. If we go up, it means that we do worse than independent. You really don't want that. If we go down, it means that we are improving over independent. And so these are the different models. This is the large free train model, the multitask and fine tuning. Uh, yeah. And so essentially, it's kind of linear. Okay. So over time, tasks become more complex. We wish to find something like this, where over time we learn better and better compared to independent and doesn't transfer anything. We don't see that. But at the same time, the task complexity also increases over time. So maybe it's too ambitious to expect that. Um, although, if you look at here, these are, there are a lot of COVID-related X-ray data sets here. And you see that none of this model of these baselines is, is doing better than independent. Suggesting that. Could you repeat, please? Uh, if you have cards where you just report the error on the model that has been uh, initialized uh, using the fine tuning of retaining without performing term, just to see from where you are starting, ah. how, how effective is uh, the fine tuning of the retraining. Yeah, so I don't have it here, but uh, we did just train the top layer, and that's much worse than continuing the whole network. Uh, but I can't remember the numbers. Yeah. OK, uh, so maybe let me say, maybe let me, yeah, yeah. So maybe I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick one, one extra result, otherwise it's a little overwhelming. Um, so one thing that might be interesting to check is whether the second time that you see a task, because remember this stream, there are some repetitions, there are about 10 data sets that we see multiple times. And so the question is, the second time that you see a data set, can you learn faster? Can you learn better? And so uh, we had this measure of forward transfer that we borrow from, from this paper, where uh, the blue line here is your baseline. So it's the first time that you saw the task, okay? And the red line would be the second time that you see the task, okay? So you look at the area under the curve for these curves, and essentially if this number is close to one, it means that you are very close to perfect um, uh, accuracy and, and you're learning much faster, right? And so what we see here, uh, if you look at the orange curve, which is fine tuning, a version of fine tuning, uh, yes, indeed, zero would be you're just the same as, as before. So indeed, every time, whenever we see a task the second time, we learn it better. We are faster or we converse to a better point, which is reassuring. Uh, okay, so let me conclude. So the, the, the point of this talk is that efficiency, not just accuracy, matters. And I think it matters nowadays very much so because we are trying to make models as large as possible. And, and uh, even if you have a lot of compute, distributing that compute is non-trivial uh, and we are all starving for compute, right? Uh, and we are not even doing a pass over the data. So, uh, but yeah, so we, we need to feed more, more data and make models bigger. We know that we can analyze better that way, but our current way of training is rather inefficient because every time we train from scratch, we, we uh, shuffle the data. So can we do better by stepping back, seeing that the actual process is a never ending process. And if we do that, maybe we can better figure out how to transfer over time and have a living distributed system that is efficient. So that, you know, if you see new data, you just add a little bit to it or you update a small part of it. So that, that's, that's the, the question. So this benchmark doesn't solve that problem, okay? But it's just a playground. So if you're interested in, in, in this area, now you can play a little bit. You can take a subset if you want, but at least you have a framework and some, some metric that 
lets you assess generalization to new tasks, not to just examples from, from the same distribution, and measure efficiency, uh, compute in this case. Uh, so in terms of the methods, I didn't propose any new method, nothing is new here, uh, just baselines. But the, the interesting finding here is that some combination of large scale pre-training with fine tuning works quite well. And this points in the, in the direction of having a population of models that evolve that you can combine. Here we did it in a very nice way because each member of that population is an entire net. But maybe there are ways to mix and match and, and to use parts in the future. So there are a lot of open research questions. Uh, I just want to maybe um, conclude saying that the paper is an archive. There is a GitHub repository where you can reproduce the major results of this paper. And you can plug your learner, both in PyTorch and Jax, although there is more support for Jax because of, because this comes from Google. But uh, yeah, so take a look. Maybe it is useful for your research, hopefully. And if you have questions, um, I'll hang around here, so I'll be here. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. But um, but the, the, the good news, the good news, uh, don't be pessimistic. The good news is that there is this region. You can take a subset. You can do a lot of interesting things, even, yeah. Uh, so we did a lot of development taking a subset of 20 tasks. So we uniformly subsample uh, the, the task in the stream to reduce also for us, right? So you can do that. Um, so you can be creative. But, So, so as I said, the, the total number of images is about a million. So it's about eight times image net 1,000. Then different data sets have also are stored in a different way. Some come as zip packages, some come as, yeah. But um, roughly, I would say eight times image net. Uh, if image net is a, a unit <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this one? Or, or, the, or yeah, okay. So my question is that I see that there are less points for multitask, uh, and also it seems to me that the cache is uh, to maybe match with yeah, 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 yeah. fine tuning, sorry. Yeah. And so, of course, the training is the one that is getting the best results, but I was wondering uh, uh, if uh, yes, why then. you are not going forward uh, because the data set were. Uh, not enough, or so, uh, so all the experiments, so there are many other points that we did in a report, just not to clutter too much. Uh, all the experiments on this side, uh, actually, yeah, on this side of, of the graph use, uh, what was it, uh, um, a ResNet of a certain size. And we did up to 16 hyperparameter search for each task, okay? And so uh, the multitask was essentially quite expensive because if you need to uh, iterate also past data sets, at least in the naive way that we did it, you very quickly end up over here and it was just taking too long. So we ran out of patience. Um, this one looks bad because it includes the pre-training cost. If you don't include the pre-training cost, then it would be more over here, which is why we, we could run it, because we took an off the shelf retraining checkpoint. So, but then you do end to end training or uh, just, uh, 
So the pre-training is, is done by other people, right? We, we've got the, the parameter vector from, from whatever. And then uh, we fine tune everything, yes. We try also to train just the head. Ah, yes, now I remember why. So because we pre-process the images to be 64 by 64 pixels, and the pre-training is done on bigger resolution images, just training the head was terrible. <laughs> Unless you pre-train on images of that resolution. So we had to fine tune everything and then it was working very well. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So the reason is because it's log scale, and things and and the cost of retraining relative to the cost of hyper parameter search and running on the stream is much bigger. So it looks like if you just zoom in there, it looks like this. If you don't include the pre-training because you say, okay, the pre-training cost is free, somebody else did it, it's not my business. <laughs> now it will be over here, but here the emphasis was also to say the cost of development should be part of the graph. But again, it's not important. If you just work on the top of, oh yes, one way to reduce computation is start from a pre-trained model, be smart about how you do hyperparameter search and use a subset of the tasks. I think that's a good recipe. Although the pre-trained models tend to be big, so you need to have also enough memory on your GPU. Yeah. So the question is. So the question is, if we observe overfitting on one task, what happens? Is that the question? Uh, so what happens? So we don't intervene, right? So we let the system run. And the hope is that the parameter vector of that task that is overfit is not picked up in the future if you do smart fine tuning. But it has happened. Something that I didn't show you, which is worrisome, is that if you, if you, if you, if you, right, if you remove all the small tasks that have less than 10,000 images, you actually do better on average. So with these baselines, okay, just because the fine tuning is too greedy in, in the choice of the checkpoint, many times you pick small tasks where you overfit and, and, and you do worse then. So also because the, maybe we use too few examples to do the Kenya stable. So you do see that. And, and uh, but again, that's an opportunity for research, right? Any other questions? And in this case, is it possible to forget them? Like, you forget a password? Or, uh... Uh, you, uh, yeah, no, totally. You can do anything that you like. The only constraint that we put for you is to, re is to report true generalization to new tasks and, and compute. Then the meta learner can decide, oh, I'm gonna check if there is overfitting training validation, I'm gonna disregard this from my pool of, we didn't do that, but that could be a very smart automatic system in a, in a lifelong setting. It's a big role, it's a big role. It's, it's one of the largest data sets and perhaps one of the largest in the object recognition uh, we have some other in OCR, but uh, yeah, it's very important. So, the metaverse, so the row number two means that you're doing everything without uh, just removing image. Yeah, it's pretty major, it's pretty major. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, you can see it also from, from these graphs where ImageNet is, a, is the largest tab, right? Uh, and also from here where ImageNet was over here. But again, if you going back to your question over fitting, there are, if you look at carefully at this graph, you'll see that sometimes we start from a tiny data set that doesn't make any sense. So, yeah.
that happens just because of the heuristics to choose where to fine tune from. So there is a lot of room for improvement here. Yeah. Totally. Also the yeah, yeah, totally. So we we did try hyper uh, Bayesian hyperparameter optimization, but without doing any transfer for that. That would be quite interesting. Totally. Yeah.